for you. One is, uh, what book of the Bible have we been studying for the last 10 or 12 months? Anybody know? What? Luke. All right, good. And the second question is, uh, can anybody tell me what the series title is? That you may know the truth. All right, very good. Okay, and for bonus question, what chapter of Luke have we been in the last couple of weeks? 12. All right. Hey, y'all are great. Y'all are really good. So that's where we're going to be, is we're going to be in Luke chapter 12. We'll be in verses 54 through 59 this morning. And uh, so if you have a Bible, feel free to use that. Or if you've got one on your phone, use that or your tablet. Or if you have it memorized in your head, I'm not sure. But, but feel free to, to use it. I also have scriptures up on the screen. And then uh, we'll have, there's some things that you can write down. If you want to take notes, then feel free to do that. You can I like to use an app called Evernote to take notes on my phone sometimes, but whatever it is that you want to use to stay engaged and to stay engaged with, with the message and, and with, the, with the words and all that, please do that so that, um, so that you can listen along and follow along and maybe look back at it later and, and, um, and remember. So I want to talk to you about something that has probably been going on since the very beginning of time, uh, but it's only really been diagnosed uh, the last, oh, I don't know, 14 to 16 years, especially with the advent of mobile phones, not really mobile phones, but with smartphones and uh, with the internet and all those types of things. And it's this thing, it's called FOMO. All right, FOMO, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but uh, FOMO stands for fear of missing out. All right, and this is, this is a, a something that, that people have is when they say, oh, that person's got FOMO, you know, they, it's like, oh, I don't want to miss out on this because I, I could be doing this, but I, I want to be over here, I want to be over there, and so it's the fear of missing out, and if you want to go to the next slide of the definition, it's a pervasive apprehension that others might be having rewarding experiences from which you are absent. Oh, man, that person's doing that. I wish I could be there, and so this has been diagnosed the last 16 years. This is when this term came out, FOMO, fear of missing out. But not only is there FOMO, there's also FOBO, which FOBO means fear of a better opportunity. So you could be having FOMO, and you want to go over here and do this instead of what you're doing, but you don't want to do that because you might miss out on a better opportunity if you go do this thing, and so you decide to wait around and see what other opportunities come up, and that's called FOBO. Then there's also FODA, which means fear of doing anything. So it's like you have a fear of missing out on this one experience, and so you don't want to miss that. But then there could be a better experience that you could be having, taking a part of. But then it's like, I don't know if it, I, I could have that opportunity, but I, I don't want to miss out on this. So uh, I guess I just won't do anything, and I'll just stay home tonight and watch TV. So FOMO, FOBO, and FODA. So there you go. There's three new words for you that you can use and sound really smart as you... Um, go about your week. So with FOMO, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let me give you a few examples of FOMO. You are out on a really nice candlelight, candlelit dinner with your significant other, your spouse, your boyfriend or girlfriend or, or whoever, and you're enjoying this nice conversation, and there's a person with a violin who comes by from time to time and plays a song for you at your table, and it's really, really romantic, and then all of a sudden, ring, and your, your phone dings, and you look down, and there's a picture of your friends, and they're like, hey, we're at this great party, there's confetti, there's lights, it's an awesome concert, it's an awesome event, wish you were here, and you're sitting there looking up and looking down, like, oh, man, I wish I could be there, I think that I'm missing out. Now, okay, if you're an introvert, I get it, I mean, if you're at the party, you'd probably, be rather, you'd probably rather be at the candlelit dinner, but if you're an extrovert, you'd probably rather be at the party, so either scenario, there's some kind of, oh, I'm, I'm really missing out, okay. Second one, you uh, are an American, and you work for a local company, and they don't take the same holidays that Americans take, and so you're stuck in the office, or you're stuck at school, or whatever, while everybody else is out at the beach, or somewhere else, having a great time, because you, and you can't go, and so you're sitting at the office like, oh, I'm really missing out, and especially if it's like Thanksgiving, Christmas, those types of holidays, there's that, that tension that's going on, and to be honest, you really are missing out if you have to work on those days. But next one, your young mother, you have this beautiful young daughter, you have a beautiful young, young family, and you're taking care of your daughter, and then your phone rings, and it's the girlfriends, and they say, hey, we're going to go out for coffee today. Well, I want you to come with us, and then after that, we're going to binge watch the latest Gilmore Girls episodes all on Netflix. <laughs> Come on with us. Oh, I can't be there. I've got to take care of my daughter. I wish I could be there, but, I, but I'm missing out. Last one is, uh, ladies, 
you're, this is your boyfriend, I guess, let's say. He's a nice guy, nice gentleman. He's, he's, he's a good-looking guy, he's smart, has a really good job, steady income. He's kind of plain, kind of vanilla, but, but, but he's good. But then there's this other guy that you know about, and, I mean, he is like, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> he's a hot mess, okay? He's a hot mess, but you know that if you date him, oh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a good time, and he's a little bit crazy, but, you know, you could be missing out on that guy. And so, so we all have these experiences from time to time, so it's called FOMO, fear of missing out. And symptoms of FOMO are it's a failure to commit. Like, I know that if I commit to do this, then I may miss out on this experience, and so you just don't commit at all. Um, or you think in your mind, well, if I do this, then I won't be able to do that. Um, or you think, man, I may miss out on the event of a lifetime, and this one experience could change my life forever, and I don't want to miss out on that. And so that, that is FOMO. And do you know who the greatest enabler of FOMO is? Mark Zuckerberg the inventor of Facebook, because now, you, before you just heard about stories and heard about things that people did or they'd show you a slideshow, but now it's like on your phone all the time. Open your phone, click on Facebook. Oh, man, my friends are in Kunding. I wish I could be there. That sounds great. Uh, man, she went shopping. Look at that dress that she bought. It looks incredible. I wish I could have been there and, and, and gone with her. And Oh, I've missed out on all of these experiences, and I've missed out on all of these opportunities, and FOMO strikes again. And so the, the rise of Facebook and the proliferation of smartphones have provided us with a constant drip, drip, drip of the things and the experiences that we don't have that everybody else gets to have except for us. And what's interesting about FOMO is that no matter which option you choose, you're still missing out on something. And uh, even uh, FOMO is actually biblical. Even the, uh, the Apostle Paul had FOMO. You don't believe me. I'm serious. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just read it. Paul writes this, he says, uh, for me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I am pressured by both. I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better, but to remain on in the flesh is, uh, is more necessary for you. So even, even the, the Apostle Paul had FOMO. And so it's something that's been going on for a long, long time. And so the, the question for us is, how do you deal with FOMO? Like, how do you choose what is right, what is wrong? How do you choose what is actually the best experience? How do you choose what is the not-so-good experience? And so as we've gone through Luke chapter 12, whether or not you realize it, there's this tension that's going on throughout the whole chapter of what is right and what is wrong. What is actually the better experience? what is the better event, and which one is actually the worst experience and the worst event. And so, um, so as we look at, at through Luke chapter 12, there's a couple things that I want to point out to you of the, of the decisions that, that Jesus is presenting to this crowd. There's a crowd of thousands of people who've come around to hear Jesus preach in this chapter. And uh, they're all sitting there, they're listening, and as Jesus is talking to them, he's telling them basically, listen, you can choose to have a really good experience something that you don't ever, ever, ever want to miss out on, and that would be God. Or you can choose these other ways over here that look like they're really good things and that you may not want to miss out on, but I'm telling you that that is the lesser of the experiences. That is the road that you don't want to go down. The road that you really want to go down, what you really don't want to miss is experiencing God. And so, so he gives them all kinds of, of examples. He said, first, you can be a hypocrite. You can try to make the, both, the, the best of both worlds. You can try to, to look spiritual, yet do the things of the world. You can try that, but I'm telling you, that's not the best way. Another one is you can... You can fear man. You can fear people. In other words, like you can try to live to impress people with the way you look and with your lifestyle, but I'm telling you, that's not where it's at. What I'm telling you is that you need to fear God. He's the one. That's the more important event. That's the more important experience that you need to have. But instead, we see these things over here with people. Like If I dress a certain way, if I look a certain way, or if I don't say that, or if I don't preach about God, if I don't, if I don't share with people, or whatever it may be, I, I, if I don't claim that I go to church, then I'll be okay with them. But as soon as they know about that, then it may not be so, so good. So rather than experiencing God, I'd rather kind of miss out on that because I don't want to miss out on this opportunity over here. 
Also, he talks a lot about wealth and riches in this chapter uh, also. And so the, the, the choice in front of us is like, what are you going to focus on? What is going to be the main thing in your life? Is it going to be saving up for retirement, not being generous, holding on to all that you have so that you can enjoy it? Or is it better to be generous and be generous toward God? And so Jesus presents this opportunity. Which one are you going to choose? Which one do you want to miss out on? Which one do you want to take part in? Because money and retirement savings and those types of things, like I can go online and I can pull up my bank account or I can pull up my retirement and I can see how I'm doing. And so that registers in my mind. But if I'm building up treasures in heaven, I'm not really sure like what my bank account is up in heaven yet. I will know someday. And so, but it's so much easier to choose the things that are in front of us. Like, I'm going to focus on that. I'd rather not be generous. I'd rather hold on to all that I have so that I can enjoy my retirement. And then another topic that he covers as well is anxiety. I mean, FOMO is anxiety. Oh, am I missing out on this or am I missing out on that? And it brings up this anxiousness in here. And Jesus talks about that as well, but he, he puts it in more in like, uh, how, what are you going to where, what are you going to eat, and what are you going to drink? And so oftentimes we think, am I, do I have the latest styles? And I go through this about every two or three years whenever we go back to the States because I don't really update my wardrobe just a whole lot while I'm overseas. But then I think, oh, man, is this shirt going to look okay when I get off the plane? Like, am I going to look like three or four years out of date, maybe eight years out of date? And so you go through this anxiety and what am I going to do? What am I going to say? What am I going to look like? Do I, do I look like, because I'm a missionary, do I look like a missionary or do I look like a normal person? And so there's this anxiety that, 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 that I go through. And so Christ is he's, he's telling us, like, listen, you can, you can experience those things. And I, and I, and I know that, that you want clothes and you want great food, but I'm telling you that there's something better and that God is going to provide those things for you if you would just work on trying not to miss out on God and on God's experiences. And so this whole time he's been setting this up. And the last one is that waiting for the master's return. It's like we can think, you know what? God's not going to come back for a really long time. I mean, maybe he'll come back in my lifetime. Maybe, but it's been 2,000 years, and he probably won't. So I'm going to live for me. I'm going to do what I want to do instead of what God wants me to do. And so instead, I would rather not miss out on what everybody over here is doing. I'm going to go, go out, and I'm going to do what the world wants me to do. I'm going to spend my money. I'm going to get all the latest clothes. I'm going to go to all the parties. I'm going to do all this instead of experiencing God. And what Jesus is saying is like, hey, you are missing out on the greater experience here. And so there's something that I would like to propose to you. And it's, I'll just warn you, it's really simple. It's nothing profound, but it's just a reminder that I need in my own life. And I think that it's a reminder that we all need in our own lives. And it's this. We need to re redirect our FOMO to God to have the best experience. Redirect your FOMO, your fear of missing out, to God to have the best experience. In other words, God, I don't want to miss out on you. I see all these other options over here, and they look good, they look nice, and, and maybe they're fun, but really, Lord, the one thing that I want is you, because I don't want to miss out on what you have to tell me. And so, so there's a worldly FOMO and there's a godly FOMO. And so we have to choose which one it is that we are going to have. Do we want to uh, fear missing out on the world, or do we want to fear missing out on God? And so all of Luke is, is leading up to this point, all these decisions that, that we can make, and what's the best and what's not the best, and what should we miss out on and what should we not miss out. And so it brings, uh, it brings us up to uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 54 through 59, and we're going to look at the, at the first couple of verses, 54 through 56. So if you've got your Bible, uh, open to there, or you can read on the screen. So Jesus, he's talking to the crowds, and he says to them, when you see a cloud rising in the west, right away you say, a storm is coming, and so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say, it's going to be a scorcher. And it is. So these people are in a certain area of the world. It's in Israel. And the weather patterns are fairly basic. And so when there is a cloud rising in the west, you pretty much know, hey, there's going to be a storm coming. And when the wind starts blowing from the south, you know, okay, it's going to be a really, really hot day. And so everybody pretty much knows, like, this is the way that it's going to be. And so what Jesus does, I think his response is just fascinating. Because if I moved to a place and somebody said, hey, Mike, okay, you're in Taiwan now? Okay, I'll just tell you, when you see clouds on the west side, that means that the storm's coming, and when the wind is blowing from the south, you know it's going to be, like, really hot and humid and all that. And I'd be like, wow, that's really cool. I'm glad that you told me that. 
Well, Jesus doesn't say that. I mean, Jesus could have been like, wow, you guys are so smart. You've got it all figured out. Like, I mean, I created this world, and you've been able to kind of figure out the code here. Maybe I should have made it a little bit more complicated, but, but you guys are good. But no, he doesn't say that. His actual response is, you guys are hypocrites. You're hypocrites. And like, what? What in the world? Why is he saying that? He says, you're, you're hypocrites because you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why don't you know how to interpret this time? That's a really good question. You can interpret everything around you. You see the clouds, you see the sky, you see the people, you know what the latest styles are, the fashions are, all that, all this stuff. You can interpret these things, but why don't you know how to interpret this time? Godly FOMO, we can get godly FOMO by applying the Bible to our life. And that's point number one. Get godly FOMO by applying the Bible to your life. Because here's what happened right here. Luke has been writing up all this time, hey, you can, you can have this opportunity or you can have this opportunity. And what Jesus calls, I mean, at the beginning, he calls out the Pharisees. He says, you guys are hypocrites because what you're doing is you are studying the Bible. Like, you know all of these things in the Bible. You can, uh, the Pharisees could, could quote from Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy. They had it memorized down to the T. They, they could write it out. I mean, that's, if you want to be a Pharisee, that's what you had to do. The, the Sadducees and the scribes were, were the same way. They knew it all. And Jesus is saying, you know the Bible. You know all this stuff, yet here I am standing right in front of, you, uh, in front of me, and you cannot recognize the person who's here. You can't recognize that I'm the Son of God, that I am Jesus, that I am the Savior of the world, everything that, that the Bible has foretold for thousands of years, and here I am, and you're missing it? Like, what is going on? Like, you can see what's going on in the clouds and the skies, and, and you can know all, all the Bible, but you can't see me, you haven't figured out that, that I am the one. And what he's saying here is, is that you guys have missed applying the Bible to all of your life. Like you, you study it and you study it and, and you study it, but you don't, you don't know it. You don't, you don't apply it. And when you don't apply it, then, then you miss out on what is right in front of you. You're missing out on God and you're missing out on the experiences of God. And, and that's, that's the fear that I have for myself and that's the fear that I have for us is that we can study the Bible. We can go to, to Bible class. We can, we can look at it. We can, we, we can read it. You can learn all 66 of the Bibles, and I can ask you to come up here and, 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 and say them for me, or we can do sword drills. I grew up doing that. You know, where's Philippians 121? The first person gets there, and they stand up. And they, oh, I got it, and they read it. I mean, you, we can do all of those things. You can learn it all to a T, but if we don't apply it, then we miss out on the experiences of God, and we miss out on the most important things. And so that's the basic message that Jesus is saying here is like, you guys, you're hypocrites. Like, you look really spiritual on the outside, but inside, you're not. You're not applying any of the things. You're not, you're not really trying to discern the times. You're not trying to experience God, and you are missing out on the most important thing in your life, and that's, that's me. It's Jesus. He's standing right in front of them. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in, in college, I had, had to take a class. It was called business law, and it was really boring because I don't really care for law that much. But, but uh, up to that point, for most of my studying career, like when you study for a test, you got to know like you got to know the facts. Okay, so I would look at, at a word and okay, what is the definition of this word, and I could tell you what the definition was, or or when was this uh, law created? 1967, or, or um, you know, th those types of things. So it was, just, it was all just based on, on what are the facts. And that's how I had learned how to study. And then I get into this business law class, and I'm preparing for the first, the very first test. And uh, so I go through, and I'm studying my textbook. Okay, I know who this lawyer was. I know what this Supreme Court case was. I know what this business law is. And so I knew it all. And then I get to the test, and none of those questions were on the test. I mean, none of them. And the point of the test was, can you actually apply the laws to whatever the specific business situation was. And I didn't know how to answer that because I just knew the facts. I was looking for A, B, C, or D, and I would write in C or D or, or A because that's what I was so used to because I knew the facts. But in that class, what I learned is that the facts don't matter. It's how you take the facts and you apply them. And uh, I missed out on a really good grade. I got like a 65 on the test or something. And so I learned at that point, like, oh, okay, now I got it. Now I get it. Now I see what the professor is wanting. He doesn't want me to learn the facts. 
he wants me to be able to take those and to actually apply them to the business situation so that I can uh, do whatever that is according to, to the law. And so my, my grade from the semester, I did really well on the, on the second two tests, but I ended up with a B, and I missed out on the A because I, I missed out on, on the wrong type of studying. And so, but we can study the Bible for hours. We can learn all the facts. But what, what Luke is saying to us and what Jesus is saying to us is don't do that. I mean, it's good to learn those things, but the main thing is that you actually apply them to your life. So when you are feeling anxious and you are wondering, am I going to look like a missionary whenever I land at home or if I'm going to look four, to, four years out of days? Like, don't worry about those things. Like, trust God. Like, God is going to provide for you. But if you don't actually trust God, then you're only trusting in yourself and you're going to miss out on the greater experience, which is, is who God is. And so... Um, so for us, we need to look at the Bible and think, okay, Lord, what is it that I need to apply? Because these people in here, they're focusing on their worldly cares, and they totally missed out on Jesus. So we say, okay, God, where is it in, the, in your word that I need to apply to my own life? Because I don't want to miss out on what you have to offer because that's the better thing. Yet I know that whenever I focus on, on, on the physical world and, and, and what, what I'm going to look like, that I'm actually missing out on the better experience because I'm not even experiencing God. I'm just experiencing my own, my own desires. And so, Lord, what, how, how do I apply those things? So here's what I would like for you to do. This is your homework for this week, is to go through Luke chapter 12 and read it. Read the whole chapter and then read it again. And ask yourself, God, where am I not applying these principles in my life? God, where is it that I'm fearing people instead of fearing you? Lord, where is it um, that I want their approval instead of your approval? God, where is it that I'm anxious when, when I shouldn't be anxious? And where do I focus more on money instead of focusing on generosity? And Lord, am I even living in expectation of your return? Am I even living the type of life that, that, that you want me to live? And so when we do that, we're not just gaining knowledge. Like you're gaining uh, the experience of God because we are applying it in our lives, and that is what God wants for us. And so we got to get godly FOMO by applying the Bible to our life, and thus we redirect our FOMO to God to have the best experience. So application is one. Number two is we get godly FOMO by reconciling our relationships. So read with me Get godly filmed by reconciling relationships. You can write that down if you want. So read with me uh, verse 57 through 59. And Jesus is continuing uh, his dialogue, his discourse with another question. Now, why don't you judge for yourselves what's right? Well, that's a good question. Probably because I'm focused on all this other stuff instead of actually focusing on God. And I'm missing out. And he says, as you are going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. And then he won't drag you before the judge, and the judge hand you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last cent. Okay, most of us are not getting dragged off to a judge that I know of. Maybe you are, and if so, then this passage applies directly to you. Here's how you figure it out, okay? He gives us the instructions. But since most of us are not actually going through that experience, there's, there's some other concepts that we can pull out of here. And one is relationships. We must reconcile our relationships because when we do that, we actually get godly FOMO because like, God, I don't want to miss out on reconciling a relationship and how you're going to work through this. And so, um, but what we see here is we've got two options here. All right, we can either make an effort to settle with the person to make it right or we can make an, we, we don't take any effort and we don't even make the relationship right. And so FOMO says, okay, if I seek out on restoration and reconciliation, then I am going to miss out on relaxation, peace, and not having to get into the messy details of a relationship. Because, you know, when you've hurt somebody, when they've been offended by something that you've said or something that you've done or some type of action, you know that sometimes it's not always just a, hey, I'm sorry about that, didn't mean to do that. A lot of times it gets much more messy in that, especially in close relationships or in marriages. And so you know that, okay, if I go and I deal with this, this means that it's going to be a really long conversation. It means we're going to be up really late at night, and I'm not going to get a good night of rest when I could rather just be checking my, my Twitter feed and going off to sleep. And so it's, I can either 
miss out on Twitter or miss out on Netflix, or I can deal with this relationship. But the whole time, there's this tension going because, you know, okay, if I'm focusing on the relationship, maybe I'm missing out on this, and so there, there's the vice and versa there. But godly FOMO says this, I would rather seek to restore the relationship so that I don't miss out on God. I'd rather seek to restore the relationship that I, so that I don't miss out on God. So you got two options. you got to make an effort to settle with the person, or you can not make the effort. Then you got FOMO. So like I said, you can, if you're going to restore it, you can get on the phone. You can say, honey, I need, we need to talk. You can go make a visit to whoever it is, your friend, coworker, boyfriend, girlfriend, student, or, or a parent, or, or whoever. Or you can stay home, and you watch Netflix, and you can ignore it. But besides thinking through those two things, you have to think further out. Like, what is going to be the actual result if you take those actions? So if you get on the phone or you make a visit with that person, there is the possible chance that you could actually restore the relationship with that person. Yes, it may take some time, or maybe they won't even reciprocate. Maybe they'll say, no, I don't even want to talk to you ever again. But at least you can say, okay, I at least took the chance to try to fix the relationship, and I at least did what God asked me. Or it may be that they do want to, to restore the relationship, and it turns out to be this beautiful, wonderful thing, and, and, and you both experience God because God cares about our relationships that we have with other people, and so God is at work there, and so you can walk away like, wow, Lord, I really experienced you in this reconciliation. Either way, we've done the right thing that the God has wanted us to do. Or if you take the other option, the result is they could take you to court. I mean, if you're, if you're married and the relationship has gotten that bad, there could be a divorce involved. Hopefully not, but that could happen or if it's a business relationship. But more than likely, the person could make your life just miserable, say nasty things to, about you online or talk about you behind your back. Um, it could be nothing. It could be, hey, you know, messed up, and I'm just going to let it lie, and they may just ignore you for the rest of their life, and you may ignore them for the rest of their life. But either way, you missed out on God's plans because God wants you to reconcile the relationship. God is in the business of restoring relationships, and that's what he did to us. And that was the problem with the Pharisees is, is that they would just ignore things. And, and Jesus is saying, you are missing out on what is best. You are missing out on experiencing God. You are missing out on me who's standing right in front of me. You're missing out on it all, and instead you're choosing to go over in this area and do those things because that is what you would rather do because you don't want to miss out. And so Jesus is implying here, he's like, I don't want you to miss out on the best option. I don't want you to settle for mediocrity. I don't want you to ruin your life. I don't want you to ruin the lives of others. And choose me, choose my ways so that you don't miss out on God's best. Now, I will tell you this, and I know from personal experience, that when you try to reconcile a relationship, when you try to make it better, it is hard. I mean, it's not always easy to go to the person and say, hey, I'm really, really sorry. That was my fault, and I messed up. It will take courage, and it will take humility on your part. And here in the scripture, I mean, this guy is really, really mad. And why is he mad? It's because the other person that Jesus is talking about has hurt him. He's hurt him. So Jesus is saying, if you've hurt that person, and you want to experience God, you need to go settle with that person. You either settle with him, make your life happy, or you can go to jail and make your life miserable. Which one are you going to choose? Which one do you want to miss out on? Hopefully we would choose the, the better way. Um, I am, uh, I'm turning 40 in, in a few months and in March, and I've kind of been going through this time of, I don't know, being more introspective. Maybe it's a midlife crisis. I don't know what, what it is, but <laughs> turning 40. And maybe, maybe it's because, see, when I was like, 18, 19, or 20, I'd be at church talking with older guys who were like 40, 41, 42. And uh, inevitably, sometimes the, you know, the, the topic of age would come up and be like, yeah, I'm 41, and I'm 42. And I'd say, you know what? I can double my age and still not be your age. So if I'm 19, I can double 19, and I'd only be 38. And now that I'm turning 40, I realize, like, I'm running out of the ability to double my age anymore because I'll be dead whenever I do double my age. And there's not many people who are 80, 90 years old and that I can really do that uh, anymore. And so that's kind of like, uh, okay, I'm, I'm running out of time um, on that. But, but really, 
I, I realized that, okay, I've been able to take stock of like the first 20 years of my life. Like I've, I've been able to look back at the events of all that and I've kind of figured out all of that for the most part. But, but it's like, I'm getting close to 40 and I'm like, what, where did the last 20 years go? I mean, I graduated, I got married, we had kids and boom, here, here I am today. And it's like, what happened over the last 20 years? It just went by so fast and, and in such a blur. And so, so as I've been looking at the last 20 years, um, a few weeks ago, I got out my, my journal and I just started looking at whenever uh, Morgan and I were first married. That was like the first journal that I ever wrote. I try to, to journal uh, as often as I can. Um, I'm not always consistent on it. But I was looking through that. I was like, man, there's some really funny things that I wrote in here whenever I was 20. But then there's some other things. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, I said that or I did that or I, or I acted that way. And, and uh, so, some of it was, was, was actually toward my wife. So I went to her one night and said, honey, I, I, uh, I've been reading through my journal. And um, I said, there are some things that I did 20 years ago that just really weren't right. And I don't think that I ever apologized for them. And uh, so I said, I'm sorry for, for the way that I acted back then. There you go. If I ever hurt you, dear, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, so will you forgive me? She said, well, yeah, of course, of course. And, but I, what I noticed is that it brought more of a depth to our, our relationship. And, and if I hadn't have journaled about those things, I, I probably would have totally just forgotten about them, never even realized that those were issues. But because I could, I could look back and say, oh, wow, okay, I really need to, to grow in that area. And so it was a sweet, a sweet moment. And I don't say that to, to brag up here, hey, look at Mike, he's awesome or anything like that. I just, I just say that because I want all of us to, to be doing that in our own lives, to be looking back at our relationships and figure out what is it that I need to reconcile with that person? Where is it that I need to apologize? What is it that I need to say, I am sorry for doing that? Because this is what Jesus is talking about here. Is that if you really want to experience God, You've got to get right with the people who are in your lives. And, and I know that all of us probably have some relationships that maybe something happened a long time ago. Maybe it was really recent. Maybe it was with a spouse or a coworker or something. But you know what those are. Those areas that where you say, I've got to figure this out. I've got to get right with that person. And even if they don't want to get right with me, at least I know that I've made the effort and that I've done what God asked me to do. And even Paul said, hey... As, as long as it's up to me, I try my best to be at peace with all other people. But the other thing that he's saying is, there, is that it's not always going to happen. But if we make those efforts then to get right, then we will experience the presence of God instead of, instead of missing out on him. So who do you need to reconcile with? Is it a spouse? Is it a friend? Is it a coworker? Is it a family member, a child? And uh, I'll just make it real simple for you, okay? Because... For me, saying I'm sorry, I messed up is kind of hard. And so I, I learned this, this little uh, this pattern. Now, let me tell you what not to do first before I tell you what to do. Uh, never, ever say, I'm sorry that you feel hurt. All right? Okay, if, if you <laughs> some of you know that you should never, ever, ever say that because you got a, a strong response. But never, ever, hey, dear, I'm so sorry you feel hurt. That's just never going to go well. So if you don't know that, just that's a freebie, take it. Um, just say, I'm sorry I hurt you. Never say, I am so sorry that my awesomeness caused you to feel unawesome. <laughs> Not a good one. I'm so sorry that my superior cognitive abilities made you feel stupid. Okay? Don't ever do that. What you need to say is, there's four steps. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I hurt you. Will you forgive me? Keep it the Charlie Brown one up. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I hurt you. Will you forgive me? Now, hopefully, you'll embellish on that a little bit and don't just say those four little simple phrases, but I am sorry that I did this and I hurt you, or, and I was wrong because I did this, and, and uh, I hurt you in this way, and will you please uh, forgive me? And say it in such a way that, that where you where you come to that point, like, God, you know, I really, I want to make this right. Because I know that, that you want me to make this relationship right. And God, I don't want to miss out on anything that, that you have. And I just want your best. So get godly FOMO by reconciling your relationships. And when, when we redirect our FOMO to God, when we say, God, I don't want to miss out, then that is actually the better experience. And in the story, there's actually a third point. There's, a, there's, a, there's another Sorry, there's another meaning that is, that is within the story. And it is get godly FOMO by getting right with God. Get godly FOMO by getting right with God. See, if we have Christ in our lives, 
If we've come to the point where we say, Jesus, I, I need you and I want you in my life, then, then we are right with God because, because his sacrifice has, has covered our sins. Uh, he is living within us. But what Jesus is saying here is, is that if you are not right with God, if you've never made a decision to follow Christ in your life, then you are the person who's getting dragged off to jail. And you will be forever separated from God. And you will, even though you may have fun in this life, you may get to experience some cool things, you are missing out on the ultimate reality. And that is being with God forever and having his presence and his guidance and his, and his direction, not only in your life now, but after you pass away, you will be with God forever. But if you are not right with God, if you've never made that, that decision to follow Christ, then you will always miss out. And you'll always miss out uh, for, for eternity. So what Jesus says is you can make an effort to settle with him on the way. In other ways, in other ways he's saying, hey, you're living out your life. You need to make an effort to settle with God because God has actually come to you and he's saying, hey, I want to get this relationship right with you because our relationship with God was broken at the fall. Whenever Adam and Eve, when, it, when they took that first bite of that apple and sin entered the world, our relationship with God was broken. And so God said, you know what? I need to reconcile the relationship that I want and, and to have that with people. And so what did God do? Well, for, for hundreds, thousands of years, sacrifices had to be made for every sin that you did. So if you made a mistake, you had to go to the temple and you had to get a dove or you had to get an ox or a heifer or something like that and put it on the altar and then they had to kill it. And then the next year, like, oh, man, I've messed up again. So now you got to go do that. And the apostles just repeated and repeated and repeated. And so finally, God sent his son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life, and he said, he is going to be the ultimate sacrifice for my people and for all of humankind. And so what happened is that we nailed Jesus to the cross. He was tortured and he suffered there and he bled for us and he died for us. And then he was put into the grave. And that was the sacrifice for us. But Jesus didn't stay in that grave. You know, he, three, days again, three days later, he rose from the grave proving that, that he was God and proving that he is the one that you do not want to miss out on. Because these people here did not understand the times that they were looking at. They were so focused on everything else. They were so focused on themselves. They were so focused on looking spiritual while, while doing all, all of these other events and activities. And, and, and Jesus says to them, you are missing out. You're missing out on the greatest thing that has ever happened in this world. And he says the same thing to us. Is like, if you don't have Christ in your life, you are missing out on what is best. You can live your life all that you want, but it's all second class. It's all second rate. If you want what is best, get God. Get godly FOMO. Experience Christ. Experience Jesus. What is so amazing about the cross and what is so amazing about reconciling relationships, if you really, really think about it, is that we don't really have that much to offer. You can take something from somebody, you can say a word to them or a statement that just cuts right to the heart, and you can damage a relationship for a really, really long time. And there's not really much else that you can do to restore that relationship. All that you have to bring to that person is just yourself and just and an apology. I'm sorry, I was wrong, I hurt you, will you forgive me? And it is such a sweet thing when that person says, yes, I forgive you for whatever it is that you did. I forgive you for whatever it is that, that, that you said or how you treated me or how you acted toward me or toward, toward my family, whatever it may be. But yes, I forgive you. And when you think about the cross, what is so amazing is that our sins put Christ on that cross. And Jesus, like, suffered big time up there. I mean, he had nails driven through his hand, nails driven through his feet. He was, he was beaten. He was, he was whipped with these massive... Uh, whips that had glass and metal in them, and he was, he was torn to shreds on our behalf. And I stand there, and I look at the cross, and I, and I think, God, like, I was the one who did that to you. My sins put you on that cross so that you could reconcile and that you could restore our relationship. And there you were, and you suffered, and you died, and you could have been really angry at me and said, Mike, you're going to pay for that. You want salvation, you're going to have to go to a cross too, and you're going to have to die for me. And I want to put you through the same pain and I'm going to put you through the same torture that, that you put me through. But that's not what Jesus did. That's not at all what he did. Because we come to, to God and we say, God, 
the only thing that I have to offer to you is just myself. And all I can say is, God, I am really, really sorry for how I've messed things up, how I have sinned. And God, I want your forgiveness. Jesus, I want you to be the sacrifice for me, and I want you to come into my life, and I want to restore and reconcile that relationship because I realize that you've been trying to do that to me, and I've, I've said, no, I, I want to do these other things. I don't want to miss out on life. But Lord, instead, I would rather miss out on life because I don't want to miss out on you because your grace is so amazing because all I can say is, God, I'm sorry. And what does God do? He forgives us. And that's such a beautiful thing in reconciling relationships, either with people or with God. Is This is all I've got is an apology. Will you forgive me? And God says, yes, I will forgive you. Or we say yes to other people. Yes, I will forgive you because I want to restore the relationship. FOMO. FOMO is the fear of missing out. So what is your FOMO? What do you fear missing out on? What do you fear missing out on in life? I'd rather do this than experience God. I would rather be worried about these things. I'd rather just be taking care of myself instead of trusting in God and experiencing Him. Or I, I would rather just ignore the relationship, just let it go. That's what I'd rather do instead of trying to reconcile that and experiencing God's grace and His, his ability to, to make things right through that. Jesus is calling us to experience Him. And what He's saying is, I am the better choice. Don't miss out on me. Get godly FOMO. Redirect your FOMO to God to have the best experience. And here's my wager, here's my bet, and the Bible speaks quite clearly to this, is that if we seek to experience God, our lives are going to be much, much richer for that than if we choose not to experience God. Jesus said, you seek first the kingdom of God. Seek me first. Seek God first. Don't miss out on me. All those other things, they'll be added to you. So not only do you get the benefit of God and experiencing Him, but you also get everything else as well. You get to experience His blessings. You get to be His child. You get to be called His own. So let's seek first God's kingdom and seek to experience Him and have godly FOMO instead of worrying about the world. I'm going to ask Jessie to come on up. She's going to play, play the, the keyboard for a little bit. So I want everybody to, to bow your head because I just want us to think and to take a couple minutes to pray and ask God to show us where it is that we have FOMO. And is our fear missing out? Is it directed to God or is it directed to others? What are the relationships in your life that need repairing? Where are the areas that you're not applying Scripture? Where are the areas that you are missing out on God's presence and God's experiences? So let's take a moment to bow our heads and close our eyes and think about those things. Lastly, I would say that if you've never experienced God, if you've never accepted Christ into your life, today is the day when you can make that, that decision. You say, Lord, I want to experience you. I, I, I don't want to experience anything else. I want to experience your presence. And uh, so if that's you, I'm not going to ask you to stand or anything, but you can pray along and you can say something like, Lord, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've gone after experiences that I probably shouldn't go after. Um, but Lord, I want to experience you more than anything else. And Jesus, I recognize that you are Lord and that I recognize that you have died for me and that you are my sacrifice. And so I come to you, I want to ask you into my heart. I want to, I want to say, Jesus, that I've, I was wrong, I've sinned, I'm sorry, I've hurt you, but will you forgive me? Will you come into my life? I want to be yours. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose again for me.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this morning that you've spoken to our hearts and uh, that we get to experience you through the body of Christ and through this church. Father, I pray that as we walk away today, as we leave here, Lord, that in our mind we would be thinking, Lord, I don't want to miss out on you. I don't want to miss out on what you have to offer for me in my life. And God, help me to apply the Bible to my specific situations. Lord, help me to see where I'm just living life without you. Because, Lord, I want to join you. I want to be with you. I want to experience you, and I want to know you more than anything else. Lord, the cares of the world and everything else that the world has to offer, Lord, I will give it all away gladly if it means that I get to experience you. And God, I don't want to miss out. So, Lord, may our eyes be open this week as we read through your word, as we read through Luke 12 and analyze our lives and get introspective. May we experience you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to close out on a song, but I want to say, if you decided to follow Christ this morning, then come talk to me or Pastor Homer or Alex, and uh, we'd love to help you out on your, on your decision and, and on your journey in faith, and uh, we'll be around. So, Rob, why don't you, let's all stand up.